make no mistake, by fighting this enemy here, you are protecting Canadians at home. Canada lately is showing the world a more combative side. The provocative and prickly side. In the face of this menace, the worst thing we could do, possibly, is nothing. Blustery and blunt. Mr. Putin makes it his business to just deliberately be troublesome. There it was again last week in Europe, a seemingly more aggressive, more hawkish Canada, and unapologetically so. It is all the subject of some debate at home, so we went beyond in search of some detached analysis. We found it hidden among the tourists and towers of Kraka. Uh, well, actually, I've been here since 2001, since my MA studies. Then I did. The Canadian Studies Department at the University of Jagiellonian is small. That's actually where Canadian studies are done. But for those bitten by the Canada bug, it is a study passionately pursued. My whole life belongs to this place. It's a small Canada in, in Krakow. <laughs> On the faculty, <laughs> Professor Marcin Gabris teaches and tweets Canadiana, often like the recent Alberta election, in real time. <laughs> Professor Tomas Soroka is a human encyclopedia of all things Canadian, past and present. Both are on the executive of the Polish Association for Canadian Studies. Both countries are located very near the much more powerful neighbors. So it was always interesting for me as a political scientist how, uh, you know, to function in the shadow of someone who is bigger and how to run your policies in order to be able to um, uh, go out of this shadow, to, to, to be noticed. Let's check this one. Uh, this might be interesting for you, because it's public television in the United States and Canada comparative analysis. It might surprise you, but there are some 7,000 Canadianists around the world busy studying and teaching about our beloved country. This is a medal that we are very proud of. They, apparently, are the only ones to get a medal from Canada's Governor General, one of a slew of Canadian officials including the Prime Minister, who visited Poland in the past year. Such visits signal Canada's current international priorities, seemingly focused on conflicts in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Its new combative tone is especially apparent when Russia moved to annex Crimea. There will be no return to business as usual with um, the Putin regime until such time as the occupation of Crimea ends. When it comes to Russia, Canada's talk is among the toughest. While some equally angry allies tried to engage Moscow, Canada was the first to pull its ambassador, Stephen Harper, the first to visit post-revolution Kiev. It all caught Moscow's attention. Let's say the Canadian government criticizes Russia, says President Vladimir Putin. Where is Canada and where is Ukraine and Russia? Distance did not dissuade Canada. Harper, we're told, confronted Putin last fall, demanding he get out of Ukraine. Last week, constantly tracked by cameras, he visited Ukraine again, then Poland, then spent 20 hours on a nearby Canadian warship while, again, we're told, Russian vessels watched. Uh, people feel that uh, Harper's uh, decision to tend to, to show strength of Canada is a is, is very positive uh, change. And yet for all the hawkish talk and Ukraine's request for defensive weapons, Canada, like other NATO allies, only offers words, money, training and non-lethal assistance, like those uniforms and boots. The fleeces, though, come from private donors. We don't prepare for this aggression from Russia, and now we need help for everything for the army. And this help from Canada, it's very significant. 
NATO and Canada can flex their muscles in NATO territory nearby. As part of the so-called Operation Reassurance, Canada sent troops to Poland. Find the corner. Hold the corner. Don't move. Hold the corner. The scenario for this joint exercise not far from Ukraine's western border is not surprisingly a border infiltration. There is a barbed message in Canadian troops taking such postures in Russia's neighborhood. One more! even if it is just training. It's all part of a growing Canadian footprint in the world's friction zones. The question is, how much of a difference is Canada making? Well, depends who you ask. We're glad to have Canadian troops over here, he says, and that we've got NATO behind us. What message does this cooperation send to Moscow? We're here. Uh, we're present in, in uh, Central uh, and Eastern Europe, and we're, we're, uh, we're present in training uh, with uh, NATO allies. That's, uh, I think, the message. Is it more symbolic than practical? Well, symbolism can be important too, so I, I do believe that we are having an effect. Mr. Putin's recklessness threatens global stability, regional stability, and has spread fear among our Eastern allies. That, my friends, is why you, the men and women of the Royal Canadian Navy, are here. But in Ottawa, the action does not live up to the rhetoric. Canada is behind on its NATO obligations. Its military spending about 1% of GDP, despite NATO's appeals for double that. And in Poland, its current commitment is a total of 220 soldiers. Is that reassuring? Definitely very positively, because it's, it's perceived as a support of, of, of Poland. But from another colleague, this point. The number is uh, so small that I don't think that it uh, affects people's minds on a, on a daily basis. But obviously it's better to have NATO troops to, to be stationed on, on Polish territory than not. Our analysts just landed in Paris to talk Canada with experts and policymakers. They're writing an entire book on the change in Canada's tone on the world stage in recent years. Canada definitely took a harder line, more clear policy, you may say, but also uh, uh, more biased. Many other Canadianists abroad agree. Among familiar words like trustworthy and determined, we also heard forceful, unconventional, belligerent, louder. That shift into more hawkish territory included dropping the Kyoto Climate Change Accord, focusing on trade, shutting out Iran, and dropping a more balanced approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Shalom. In numerous visits there, Canada's now strongly pro-Israel policy always earns officials a warm welcome on the Israeli side. While earlier this year, former Foreign Minister John Baird was pelted with shoes and eggs on the Palestinian side, a rare sight for Canadians anywhere. Whenever you take a harder line, you might expect that your reputation, at least in some spheres of foreign relations, might suffer. And this is, I think, the case in, uh, uh, in Canada to some extent. But Harper is banking on some benefits too. Kind of reminded uh, people that uh, you, you cannot always play nice, that sometimes you, you, you need to uh, make firm decisions, even if they are, are, they are not popular and even if they are not, uh, maybe, you know, not too wise in the longer run. There is one other thing that seems to link some of Harper's hawkish positions abroad, their appeal to specific voters at home. A lot of people say that actually foreign policy is mostly domestic policy, just, you know, sent 
uh, abroad and if you log into Ukrainian uh, Canadians, it, it's much ob obvious why Harper government got engaged. So to just wave Canadian flag and show that we are, we care. So what about that other big conflict, fighting ISIS? Canada is hardly unique in joining in the controversial air campaign. A group effort that so far has been less than effective. At home, even some supporters say the threat to Canada is overblown. Yet for Harper, the fight seems a major priority. Took him and the cameras all the way to Iraq. Canada is also the only Western nation besides the U.S. to strike targets inside Syria. Why? You stand on guard between the civilization we enjoy and the savagery that seeks to come to our shores. I'm not surprised. Uh, from, from what I heard from Prime Minister Harper, it's extension of his uh, previous policies. So I, I've also from, from the political point of view, it's, it's easier to gain support from, from Canadians uh, to fight terrorism. It is easier to sell it politically. Canada as a hawk, principled or hard-headed? Does it elevate Ottawa to a more influential status? They still have more research to do, but in interviews so far, the answer leans towards no. We already know that, but if you uh, hear that from the official, which is responsible for Canada, is, is something striking. So, so it's not the top uh, priority of, of, of Europe, of course. French Canada voted against prohibition. Other Canadians oh, use words like negligible, irrelevant. Of course, in the eyes of many in the world, the students at this Canadian history class, there are enduring, kinder images of Canada. First thought is maple syrup, but then I think about the masses of immigrants in, uh, which, uh, who come to Canada and uh, how well you put up with them. But today's Canada seems edgier, known here for axing a $5 million fund that supported Canadian study centres abroad like this one. Telephone, it was in, in Canada. The worst hit are the students who want to study Canada, but so is Canada itself, they said. What I think that Canada now misses in its foreign policy is, uh, is this soft power, promotion of its soft power, actually. And Canada has so much to, 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 to promote. Their book coming out next year will label Canada a selective power. But is it a relevant one? Does Canada matter? I think, yeah. We, I mean, we wouldn't waste our time. You ever did it. <laughs> A policy of being selectively engaged that often seems more about what is said than anything else. And that seems expressly made for audiences at home. Nalayed, CBC News, Krakow, Poland.